Um, so thanks everybody for joining today's sprint review. The first one without our peerless leader, Kate Borma. Um, so I'm Anne Marie Bro, and I'm one of the product owners for Folio. Um, since Kate has gone on leave, uh, various product owners are um, temporarily taking on some of her responsibilities uh, until the, the lead PO situation is resolved. So I am handling today's sprint review. So let me share my screen. All right, can folks see the slide deck? Yep, looks good. All right, cool. Um, and I added a note that the recordings will be out on YouTube. Um, so uh, that link should take you to the OLF um, YouTube channel. And we have had a lot of uh, team changes uh, as part of the new year. So uh, as we scroll through the team slides, you'll see new on various team teams. Um, uh, Michal has jumped over to Stripes Force for a little while. And uh, Damien from um, Michigan State has joined on with Thunderjet to help out with some of the acquisitions work. And oh my goodness, we have had changes on Folijet. So we have Alex, um, who's a new backend developer, Jeremy and Ryan, who've worked on other teams from Texas A&M who are helping out with the Edifact invoicing import work. And then Carol Godfrey has joined in a, in a part-time role as the EBSCO liaison to Folijet. Uh, Yulia has joined Spitfire. And Dimitri has joined Vega. And another Alexander has joined Concord. And Dimitro has joined Falcon. And Vitali has joined Firebird. And I think that's it. Yep. Um, and also some of the teams are chain are kind of refocusing their responsibilities. Um, those updates are, uh, some of them are here in the list of teams at the beginning. Um, so Spitfire is gonna be taking on some quick mark work, um, starting with the current sprint. Um, Firebird is uh, kind of moving into a maintenance role with quick mark and most of it's gonna move over to Spitfire. Um, so lots of things are happening right now. And um, the IRIS release timeline, which changed once again late last week, there's a link to that. And now I'm gonna get quiet and um, Jakob, I don't know if you wanna talk any about the core platform highlights. Uh, very briefly, since you called me out. Uh, essentially some major updates, as you guys can see on the slides. Uh, Okapi 4.6 that was released uh, last week on Friday um, um, to meet that initial deadline. Uh, as Mary mentioned, uh, the deadlines have been uh, have been pushed back, so so we have still some more time, but we don't anticipate any more platform releases. So so uh, so the plan is to stick with those initial uh, deadlines and initial releases. So Okapi 4.6, uh, the major uh, change compared to 4.5 is now is the addition of the um, the permission migration functionality so uh, a feature that I think a lot of implementers will um, will uh, will make a uh, good use of uh, so essentially with 4.6 and with updated mode permissions which is uh, which is also scheduled for iris um, permissions will be automatically uh, migrated uh, when you migrate Folio from one release to another, and the user assignments will be also migrated. Um, uh, and there will be some uh, some documentation that Crack is going to provide um, with uh, with this release. 
um, uh, there's some work for uh, module authors um, uh, when those permissions are being uh, captured in, in the module descriptor. So that's just something I wanted to uh, turn your attention to. Um, again, this is really relevant for, for people uh, who are defining permissions in, in the module descriptors. And RMB uh, uh, 30, uh, two that was released. The initial ver version was released before Christmas. That's also the uh, the, the the release month for Iris. Uh, there were two follow-ups uh, since um, since the initial release. Um, uh, a bug fix release, which was um, uh, released almost immediately, that was based on the feedback from teams trying to upgrade to uh, 32, and then a uh, new minor release. Uh, uh, 32.1, um, and this is the, the target uh, I1 release. So uh, teams um, uh, should be uh, making uh, uh, well, an active uh, attempt to migrate their modules to RM, their RMB modules uh, to this uh, this version. Um, so far, we uh, had feedback from I think five or six teams uh, that that uh, make. Uh, that, that make that attempt. Uh, there were some minor issues. Again, as I mentioned, there were results in 32.1. Uh, also, 32.1 is a release that simplifies testing a little bit. So if, if, if you have already upgraded uh, to version 32, uh, this is not really relevant for you. You can skip this one. But if you haven't, then, then target 32.1 because it, it simplifies testing um, the new asynchronous migration API. Um, uh, so it was mostly meant for uh, for uh, for, uh, for simplifying unit testing. I think that's all I have. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jakob. So it sounds like um, teams should be safe for upgrading to Okapi 4.6.0 and RMB 32.1.0, um, and and we need to upgrade before the end of R1. Is, is that right, Jakob? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, every team's got their sprint highlights in, so we're not gonna, um, in the spirit of Kate, we're not going to uh, go through the details of every sprint, but please take a look through them um, when you uh, look at the PowerPoint. And in a moment, we will get to the uh, sprint demo section. Okay, and for demos, since he's always last, Anton is asked to be first this time. So Anton, since you just have one slide, I'm just gonna leave it on my screen if that's okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I just asked to be first because uh, it's just one slide, but it's an interesting one. So I just want to introduce you to uh, defect containment efficiency metric uh, which is very simple. It's just percentage of the bugs found uh, in production or uh, after we start bug fest uh, compared to bugs found during the development process. So I have two columns, Q2 and Q3, and um, overall our defect containment rate after, after general availability is pretty good, 93, 92, uh, well, 93.5, almost 93%, which is good. But what is alarming that uh, we only find uh, around 30% of defects before we start bug fest. And it means that good 50% of, uh, 50 to 60% of defects we find during bug fest. And I don't think it's acceptable. And it tells us that the, our process um, uh, uh, so is very leaky. And it means that when we call something is done, after that, we find another two thirds of the defects after that. And this is something that we'll need to start focus on uh, during uh, this release and subsequent releases this year, uh, focusing on quality and implementing measures that would shift that pattern. Uh, we cannot just find 
34% of or 30% of defects uh, before uh, end coatings done done, and then kind of desperately fixing them during bug fest uh, week and two weeks after that. So I don't find that acceptable. I don't, I hope you don't find it acceptable either. So uh, in the coming weeks, we'll uh, need to, uh, we will come up with a proposal to the teams, how they should change their uh, workflows and uh, to, to reverse that trend. So like I said, overall, we don't incur a lot of issues when once the product goes GA. Um, so you can see that uh, tickets that filed in support, uh, it's a small, smaller number compared to the total bug count. But a lot of defect escapes into Bugfest and we need to reverse that trend. So um, that's all I have, uh, have for you for now. So thanks for, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? So I'll, I'll speak up in defense of the POs and the developers slightly. Um, I know when I'm testing, and I'm, I'm pretty sure for other POs when they test, if we're testing stories and there's a, an issue with the story, um, rather than closing the story or creating a bug, very often we'll put the story back in progress and have the developer fix it before we close the story. So I think um, we're actually catching more before Bugfest. They're just not recorded as bugs because they're part of finishing the story or the task. Um, and so they're not getting counted. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, so, wait, Anton, somebody else said something. Yeah. No, I just said that you're exactly right. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, but... Uh, the numbers also showing that we leak a lot into the, uh, maybe the percentage would be different. So uh, if uh, before bug, uh, if we flag all the bugs before the bug fest, then the number not gonna be 86 and 69, but still we do leak a lot into the, into the bug fest. And this is something that we need to, um, uh, we need to figure out how to put the lid on it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I believe we have a few more hot fixes that are going to be released for Q3 that are still being gathered up. Um, so I think that that four is going to uh, increase a bit, but so, uh, uh, good to yeah. know. Some of, so, so if the bug had a support a label on it, then it goes into support category. So some of them that included into hot fixes they are kind of, well, it's kind of uh, had to juggle the, uh, the numbers a little bit, but if it has support label, then I moved them into support category and it means it kind of was found in production. Maybe we need to think about better way to flag in pr uh, pure production bugs uh, going forward. And with Q2, it was uh, kind of harder to get the numbers because we used labels instead of releases. In Q3, we already used release field, so it was easier to kind of uh, fix, uh, get the numbers. Uh, but I do hear you about not filing bugs um, during the development. That's why that number is low. But still, the numbers after the bug, uh, you know, during the bug fest, they pr they pretty high. And yes, that's absolutely fair so, enough. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks, Anton. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. And um, the first demo is from Thunderjet. Dennis and Andre. Thank you. Yes, I think Andre is going to start us off. OK, thank you, Dennis. Hi, uh, everybody. Let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. Yes. Thanks. OK, I'm going to demonstrate the small uh, feature on UI, but it required a big effort from our backend team and uh, so important uh, for libraries, uh, I believe. Uh, we are on uh, finance app 
hope uh, it's a uh, fun. Uh, I prepared uh, one for the demo, and uh, we need to go to budget details and uh, see that uh, I'm speaking about uh, displaying uh, uh, financial information. Uh, previously, we just uh, displayed only some of the amounts, uh, but now it's uh, more and uh, here we can see three tables uh, with uh, funding information and uh, here it is uh, initial allocation that uh, can be set by user uh, during budget creation increase in allocation and uh, decrease uh, that can be changed by uh, creating uh, uh, allocation transactions and then uh, total allocated uh, it's uh, the sum uh, of uh, all allocations, uh, then net transfers uh, that uh, can be also changed by creation uh, transfer transactions, and total fundings uh, that uh, is the sum of uh, uh, total allocated and net transfers. So let me uh, show some examples how it works. Uh, so if we can want to allocate some money to our fund, and let it be $5, we can see that uh, increase in allocation was changed from uh, $20 to 25 The same for decrease. Uh, if we allocate uh, from our fund to another, We can see that it was decreased uh, from 10 to $30. And the same for net transfers. Uh, the second table, uh, it's a financial activity and includes uh, encumbered, awaiting payment, extended, and unavailable. So it's uh, all uh, financial activities, all uh, transactions that um, can made by user and here we track all of them for example uh, we have order in pending status uh, with PO line so our fund and uh, the total estimated price is $25 and if we open it and uh, go back to our budget and refresh the page Uh, we'll see that uh, encumbered was changed uh, from zero to $25. And then if we create invoice and uh, open it, uh, it is this uh, number uh, will be moved move to awaiting payment. And uh, then when we paid it, it will be in the expanded uh, column. So the next, uh, the last uh, table is uh, overages and it includes uh, over encumbrance uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, encumbered uh, minus uh, total funding and our expanded that uh, is expanded uh, minus uh, total finance too. And uh, below we can see uh, current cash balance and available balance for current budget. If we go for to fiscal year, we'll see the same uh, table with financial information, information but uh, for overall all fiscal year, the same uh, details uh, for ledger and uh, for group uh, as well. I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. It looks really good and clear, it seems like. Thank you. And that should be a great lead into what I'm about to show. I'm about to show the fiscal year rollover functionality that we've just put in place. And it's a it's a bit of a shameless plug at the same time because we're we intend to run some user acceptance testing in the Scratch environment for Thunderjet starting this Thursday. Uh, so if you're interested in participating in testing this fiscal year rollover functionality uh, long before the release, I suppose, we're hoping to catch uh, 
anything that we can improve or things that we need to make adjustments to before we actually make the release and start our bug test testing. So encouraging lots of people to participate in this. And I'm just gonna demonstrate kind of the beginning of that fiscal year rollover functionality and actually starting the rollover. I'll show you what the system will do. Some of this stuff uh, at the end of this process, the error reporting we're still working on. So I've created a simple fund structure for today. And we just saw that Andre was actually using the main library ledger, which is running on a different fiscal year from the ledger that I'm gonna roll over now. So you can see some of the activity that he was working with uh, in his demo. I'm gonna be working with a different ledger that I've created for the purpose of this. And there are just a few orders and a few invoices that have been processed against two of the funds that exist on this ledger. So he was showing you kind of the granular details at the budget level and how that translates all the way up through the fund structure to the point where you can even see for the entire fiscal year, you know, what's going on. I'm looking at the ledger level here and you can see what's been allocated, what's been encumbered awaiting payment expended uh, for the ledger as a whole. So there are two funds on this ledger, fund A and fund B for the purpose of this demo. And they're organized by type as well. So when I roll over a ledger, I'll start by clicking the actions menu. And because I am using a user that has permission to roll over, which is an explicit permission that you need to grant to a user, I have the rollover option for this ledger. And when I click rollover, it brings up my rollover settings. So the system will tell you what the current fiscal year is and the period. And if you'll notice, the period ends actually this evening at 11.59 PM. So it's saying that uh, the end of this period is basically tomorrow, January 20th. And I'm gonna roll over to a fiscal year that starts tomorrow. Uh, and there's kind of a key point to be made there that today the current fiscal year is still going to be FY 2021. So I'm running this rollover before I actually wanna start my fiscal year. And one of the things I'm going to do, you can see I have an option here for closing all the current budgets, which is going to lock down all of the budgets for the current fiscal year so no one can continue to spend, uh, to encumber, to expend any money against those budgets that we allocated for fiscal year 2021. And that's optional. You don't have to close everything when you do this. You could do it after the fact, but I'm gonna have the system help me do that. There are also a couple options here for restricting encumbrances uh, or rather for not restricting encumbrances or expenditure at the beginning of your fiscal year. You may choose to have everything be unrestricted because you're not allocating anything yet, but you want to allow people to continue their ordering and invoicing activities into this new fiscal year 2022. Uh, for the moment, I'm not going to uh, unrestrict my funds, a lot of double negatives there. But the reason being, I'm actually going to make allocations as part of this process. So the second sort of area here that we see in rollover settings is all about creating new budgets for fiscal year 2022. And there are a few decisions that we can make at this point. The system is gonna do all of this automatically for us as part of the rollover process. So my funds are organized by fund type. And I'm only using two fund types, and that's why I only see two fund types here. So I'm using a books type and an approvals type. And I'm choosing to roll over the allocation for both of these types of funds. So at the moment, for this example, there's only one fund in each type, but there could be obviously many funds of that type. So I'm going to roll over my allocation. Whatever was allocated there in the current year, I'm going to make that same allocation next year. That's what this toggle is allowing me to do. I could also make an adjustment to that allocation of a certain percentage. So maybe I could increase this by 10% if I wanted to. If there's any money left over in the budget, if there's any money available, I can actually choose to roll over that available amount as well. And I can roll it over as a transfer, which is a separate type of transaction or I could roll it over as part of the allocation. If for some reason I wanna consider this available amount part of my allocation for next year, part of my allocated amount at the start of the, this fiscal year 2022, I can do that. 
And then I can set for all of these budgets, the percentage, uh, the allowable percentage of allocation and expenditure. So for this, this type of budget, I'm going to set allowable encumbrance to 110%. For another type, uh, I'll have the allowable encumbrance be just 100 and all allowable expenditure just 100%. So 100% of my total funding in those budgets, uh, I will be allowed to expend, whereas 110% of my total funding for books uh, type funds, I will be allowed to encumber. And then finally, in our rollover settings, we're able to, to make some decisions about orders, rolling over open orders. And we separate these into three categories, ongoing orders that are not subscriptions. And there's, a, there's an actual toggle in the order record that allows you to indicate that it is a subscription order. So things can be ongoing, uh, but they're not necessarily subscriptions. Things can also be ongoing orders that are subscriptions. And we separate those two things here. So I'm gonna choose to roll over my encumbrances for all open orders. So ongoing non-subscriptions, ongoing subscriptions, and all one-time orders. And I wanna base those on slightly different things. For my ongoing orders, I'm gonna base fiscal year 2022's encumbrance on the expended amount. And for the one-time orders, I'm gonna base it on the remaining amount that's encumbered. I could also make an increase or decrease to those by a percentage. So I could increase the percentage uh, of encumbered funds in next year if I wanted to. And then click rollover. And the system will confirm with you because you can't reverse this process, uh, at least not in our first iteration here. You will get an error report and you can correct any errors with that that may have happened to budgets or uh, to orders maybe in their encumbrances, there were some errors. So you will get an error report, but it's not reversible at the moment. So you have to confirm, yes, I am ready to do this. I'll confirm, and that's actually going to roll over my fiscal year, creating all the budgets, creating all encumbrances for the upcoming year. If there were some errors, so we see a little progress bar that indicates you know, how things are progressing. I had very little to, to create, so this was very quick. It could take up to a few minutes and the progress bar will show you how far along you're, you are. If there is any error during that rollover process, the system will, once things have completed, it will alert you that there was an error and we create a CSV file uh, that lists out all of the errors. So all of the order numbers, all of the fund IDs, what the error was, was it you know couldn't make an encumbrance or something of that nature, couldn't make an allocation. Uh, so the, the report will detail basically what went wrong so that you can download this and you can fix it uh, over the next couple of days. Once you're comfortable with that, you can click to view. And I'll just make note again, the current fiscal year is still 2021. So if you're playing around with this in snapshot, that's because my fiscal year technically hasn't ended yet. It ends tomorrow, but all the budgets on this fiscal year have been closed. So there shouldn't be any activity happening in the system against this against this fiscal year, these budgets on this ledger. And if I look at my actual budget, so my A fund, I can see that I do have, you know, my current 2021 budget still appears as the current budget because we haven't started our next fiscal year yet, but the system has created uh, allocations. So it's created my budget for next year. And as soon as I wake up in the morning, this will now be the current budget and this will be a previous budget. As you can see, it's already been closed by the system. So lots of functionality uh, has been implemented. A lot of work has been done on making this fiscal year rollover possible. And again, if you're interested in participating in testing, it should start on Thursday. So thanks very much, everybody. So Dennis, there's a question about the the timing for today and tomorrow, is it lo uh, based on your local time zone or on the default UTC time zone that, that Folio uses? That is an excellent question. All right, and, we'll find uh, out, Brooks. I, yeah, and yeah, we'll have to look into over it. testing, Brooks, because I think uh, this will be super important for y'all. 
um, the this is a huge amount of work. And the one of the big challenges is that this happens once a year and can involve millions of dollars and it has to go right. And so it's a huge amount of work that ThunderJet's put into it. And it's great that it's ready for testing now instead of a few weeks from now in the in the bug fest frenzy. So great job. Indeed. Thanks. Yeah, I managed to mute myself. All right, um, so next up is Firebird. Stephanie? Hi, everyone. Um, so Firebird has been working hard on remote storage with the Domatic systems. Um, it's a particularly heavy backend feature. Um, and we are thrilled to have Vitaly with us now um, on working with us on the team. Uh, today, we will show you some early work on the front end, which is around configuring remote storage. And this is still in progress too, but because we know so many people are interested in this feature, we thought we'd show you what we can. And Alex, it's all you. You might be muted, Alex. We still can't hear you. Oh. Maybe I've got some connectivity issues. Steph, if you tell me which Alex, I can try to unmute him. Uh, whoops, I muted myself. Alex M. Molotov. Let's see if I find his name. Oh, there he is. Oh. No, I'm sorry. Mazalev, there it is. There. Do you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yay. I'm sharing the screen. Do you Great. see? It? Yes. Yeah, the remote storage. Uh, these are the settings of uh, remote storage uh, configurations. So we now can see the list of them. For now, we can only uh, watch the details. In the future, we, we, uh, we will have to, uh, we will have the probability, not uh, the, the ability to edit, add, or delete the configurations. And we could arrange these configurations to the locations here in tenant settings. Let me show you. And, edit. and here we can uh, arrange the remote storage to the location. Here we can see the remote storage already, already uh, arranged to the to this location, and it couldn't be changed here because the location already has some holdings or items associated with it. If we have a new location that doesn't have items or holdings, we can edit this. So that's it for now. I guess, thank you, <laughs> that was it. Thanks, Alex. All right. Um, anything else, Steph? Are we? That's it for us. Can, okay. I, can I ask, Steph? Mm -hmm. This is just the setting where you're telling Folio this is the location of your remote storage, and then and then there's another part of it that's where you tell the remote storage system something, right? So this is showing um, that you can create you can set up remote storage in folio settings. Uh, so you're a library and you've just decided or you have always had uh, remote storage and you wanna configure it. And then it's also um, 
uh, assigning location to that remote storage to the tenant. There will be um, ways to change uh, location through the instance as well. We're just not there yet. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, so next up is Spitfire, Kalila. Hey everybody. Um, so uh, Dennis is gonna show some of the work the team's done um, actually for several months. Um, one thing he'll show, the first thing he's gonna show, or at least one of the things he will show is um, the team's work to make um, notes um, more discoverable. So when you're assigning or unassigning a note, uh, some of the, the work we've done to improve the searching of notes so that you, you can find what you're looking for. Um, and then he's gonna spend time uh, showing uh, folks, uh, the work that the team's done for several months related to the integration of the uh, EBSCO usage consolidation uh, service. So uh, via eHoldings, you'll have the ability to see your usage and uh, also any cost information you've that has been provided um, and be able to, to see usage across several months or across a, a months, as well as see uh, uh, data such as cost per use. So he'll, he'll show that. And similar to uh, uh, something Dennis said, uh, we will be conducting user acceptance testing of usage consolidation. Um, so I'll be asking uh, folks to uh, participate in testing and uh, provide feedback um, um, uh, as far as uh, um, the, the, the service, the integration. So with that, I will hand it off to Dennis to uh, begin the demo. Thank you, Kalila. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay, um, so let me start with uh, some of the changes to uh, notes uh, application. So one change that we made is that uh, We've uh, added uh, possibility to search notes by not only their title but by the detail, detail details as well. So if we go to assign and assign and um, uh, search, for example, by word tell us, um, then we would see that we have uh, these notes that have. Uh, the word tell us in the description and you can see that uh, here we have this word and uh, if we click show more and search again yeah this uh, this note detail also has uh, this word so uh, you can search notes by their details as well um, so and uh, the next uh, feature is that uh, um, we have added uh, uh, some changes to usage consolidation. And I think on one of the pre previous demos, I have uh, demoed some uh, usage consolidation functionality. Uh, the only difference is that we have uh, added some um, uh, added summary table to all record types. So for packages, titles, and resources as well. And we have also added uh, to packages uh, a titles list and an ability to export titles. So uh, let me show you the titles list. So um, on a package table or package record, if you click uh, actions and view titles, you will see that um, uh, the title usage consolidation data will be loaded. So here's the list of um, all the titles in this package with uh, usage consolidation data like usage. Um, I think uh, cost and cost per use data is not available for this package, but that uh, can, can be configured. Uh, and uh, we have an ability to uh, load more titles. So that's uh, that will be one, 100 titles per uh, page. Um, and uh, you can also um, export this uh, title information in the CSV format. So let me move this a bit uh, some here maybe. Um, yeah, so you have an ability to export this title in uh, CSV 
uh, file. Uh, you can see that this message, message appears uh, saying that uh, this uh, export may take up to several minutes depending on how much uh, data there is. And you can see that uh, I've downloaded a CSV file. And uh, if I open it, um, you can see, um, so this data uh, for titles, uh, like title type, usage, cost, cost per use, currency selected, and so on. And uh, you can see that there's uh, like a lot, uh, lot of data, many, many rows. And uh, so this CSV file contains this uh, kind of information. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all that I wanted to share with you today. Um, uh, thank you, thank you all. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, ask in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll answer. Thanks very much, Dennis. Again, that looks like a bunch of work. All right, we have heard from two Dennis's. We're about to hear from two more Alex's. So next up is Vega Darcy. Sure, so I just wanted to provide a quick introduction. So while we've been working on the override of patron blocks and item blocks, which are huge features, um, we've also been finalizing um, the manual refund report um, as well as the age to loss notices. So we have Alex K that's going to demo the refund report and then um, Alex B that's gonna demo the age to loss notices, which are sort of pre-set up and he's gonna go through the settings to show you that. Um, one caveat to the refund report that we wanted to mention is that after we kind of went through the review process, we noticed that, or Holly noticed that um, she wanted to add the fee fine owner to both the filter criteria um, when you're generating it, but also a column in the report. And so that's a separate um, issue that we're still working on, but you'll see it without that today. Alex K. Okay, can you hear me? Is my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I'm gonna demo our new report, which is called Refunds to Process Manually. As you probably know, uh, when you have fees and fines with some payments and transfers, uh, you're also able to refund those payments and transfers. Uh, and these refunds need to be processed manually by the staff members, which is why we have this report. Uh, there's no additional setup needed to start using it, just the usual settings you need to work with fees and fines. You can find them here in users, the fine section, uh, like owners, payment met methods, refund reasons, etc. Now I have a patron here with a bunch of these fines, again with payments and transfers and different kinds of refunds. You can see refund to patron, refund to bursar. So now to use this report, we just need to go to uh, the users page, to actions, refunds to process manually. Now, unfortunately, these date pickers are not working today throughout the platform. So let's just pretend they are. And here it is. So this is the report. Uh, we have all the information about the fees fines themselves, uh, themselves about the refunds. Uh, now these UID columns are actually links. This links us to fee fine details page. And I think this is pretty much it. As Darcy mentioned, there will be uh, changes to the report. There will be uh, if you find owner column, and there will also be an additional filtering in this window, you'll be able to filter uh, the entries by the fee find owner as well. So yeah, that's all I wanted to show you today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll answer them in the chat. Thank you. Alex V. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. 
Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So today I'm going to show you another feature we've been work working on recently. It's the HTLON lost patron notices. Uh, basically, it's a new category of patron notices that encompasses notices sent when a loan is H2 lost or an automated lost item fee is charged or adjusted for an H2 lost loan. Uh, by adjustment, I mean automatic refund or cancellation of such fees when H2 lost item is returned. Now, the templates for these notices are configured as usual in the patron notice template section of circulation settings. As you can see, I have a whole bunch of templates prepared Rick. for Alex. Alex, we're seeing your notes and right. not the application. I think you need to change screens so that we see folio. Right now, we're seeing your notes. There you go. How about now? Much okay. better. Um, okay, so as I was saying, uh, I have a whole bunch of um, templates configured for this demo for uh, every possible scenario for H2 loss notices. And um, we have split um, the one category which um, we had before automated fee fine charge and adjustment into two separate categories. Uh, one for fee fine charge uh, with no fee fine action uh, tokens available, and one for fee fine adjustment with those tokens available to the user. And um, as usual, you can use those templates uh, to configure patron notice policies. So, notices for uh, loan H to lost scenario are configured in the loan notices section. Um, you just select one of your loan templates, select the trigger and event item H to lost and the desired timing. Uh, as you can see, I've con configured three uh, patron notices, um, each with the different template and um, different um, timing settings, one for one sent immediately once the loan is H to lost, one is sent five minutes after that. It's a one time notice, and one recurring after notice. And as for fee fine notices, same thing. I have three notices configured with different templates and three different timings. Um, here you just select um, the trigger and event lost item fee charged or lost item fee adjusted whichever is applicable. And I have one uh, notice for if you find adjustment. Note that uh, this one doesn't have timing settings as uh, it is sent immediately one, uh, once the if you find is adjusted. And probably it's worth reminding you how lost item fee policy is configured. Uh, basically what we're interested in, in here is that um, the delay uh, which takes place before an overdue loan is, is considered H to lost, and the delay before an H to lost loan is being built a uh, lost item fee. And also the configuration for whether we want a lost item processing fee charged or not, and the amount of the lost item fee. And that's basically it. Uh, unfortunately, there is no way to show you the whole thing in action as it takes up to 30 minutes for an open loan to become H2 lost and then uh, up to 35 minutes before the lost item fee uh, fees are charged. So uh, I have prepared the loan beforehand and um, I'm going to walk you through the whole process. So first I checked an item out, then I waited for like 15 minutes for it to become H2 lost. Um, sometime after that, um, lost item processing fee and lost item fee were charged. I have uh, paid partially the lost item processing fee and uh, transferred partially lost item fee to produce um, 
all the nodes as possible in this scenario. And then I checked the item in. And I have been receiving patron notices throughout the whole loan life cycle. As you can see, there are many. So I'm going to walk you through all of them. Uh, first of all, uh, I have received a loan edge to loss notice. This uh, this is upon add notice, which happens immediately once the loan changes its status. I received one um, notice which is sent after the loan is edged to loss and one recurring notice. Uh, right after that, once lost item fees were charged, um, I have received two um, upon that notices for one for lost item processing fee and one for lost item fee. And then again, two after notices, one for each of the fees fines, one uh, uh, one time notice and, and one recurring. A few more recurring notices for the same fees fines. And uh, then I checked the item in and for that produced four fee fine adjustment uh, notices, one for a lost item fee refund, one for lost item processing fee refund, and two notices for the cancellation of both these fines. And I believe this is it. If you have any questions, I'll post them in the chat. That's it. Thank you. I just wanted to add a quick thing that, you know, in addition to it being tricky to demo live because you have to kind of wait for certain triggers to hit. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention that he also obviously set that up to a way that we wouldn't probably use it in production. So you wouldn't normally get, you know, so many reoccurring notices. I just thought I'd mention that. Um, you'd probably set it to be more like one every one day instead of every few minutes, but this is good to demo that it actually works. Thank you, Alex's. I, I have to say the the tokens and the the ability to create customized staff slips and patron notices is one of my favorite parts of Folio. And um, we all think our particular apps are complicated, but the amount of detail that goes into um, all of these triggers and are we charging fines? Are we waiving fines? Um, at what's getting done by the system, what's getting done by a person. It's spectacularly, impressively complicated. So I am glad I am not dealing with circulation and with users. Okay, next up is Leipzig, Richard. Yes, um, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So let's share my screen. Um, it says I cannot share my screen. Another participant is sharing. Oh, is one is Alex still sharing? I think so. Yes. Okay, Alex, could you unshare? All right, I think you can share now, Richard. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So I want you to show the work we have done in the users app and in the e usage app. And I'm starting with the users app. So first of all, we um, added to the patron groups an additional column. It's an expiration date offset in days. So this means it's a standard value, which can be used to extend um, the expiration date of a user automatically. For instance, for faculty, we defined it to be 365 days. So this is a year. And this then can be used in the users app. So for instance, um, select the user which belongs to the faculty group. And here we can see its expiration date is, um, I think it's tomorrow. And if we edit the user, we can now recalculate the expiration date and set it automatically to 365 days from now. So here you can see it's set to 2020, 2020. And we can save it and it's updated here. 
Um, the second thing we did for UI users um, was to add um, templates for manual pattern blocks. So here I created a sample a template called reader card loss. So if a user has lost its uh, reader card, we can use this template and we don't have all the stuff in the library um, does not have to type in again the same information again and again. And this then can be used in the users app as well. So if we want to block this user, for instance, we can open the actions menu, select create block. And here now we have the option to select the template name. And this is the uh, template I showed you before. And if I select it, the information is added here and um, it can also be changed by the library stuff if needed. So we can type in something and um, this may reduce the work of the library stuff. And um, now I want you to show small things we did in the usage app. So first of all, we have an additional filter. We can filter for report types, which are available on the backend. So if I select this filter, so we only have J1 counter reports, which are journal reports. And if I select it, we only see the uh, usage data providers providing this report. As we can see here, um, the usage data provider American Chemical Society supports the report J1. And we added the possibility to upload not only non-counter reports, but also to um, not to only upload files, but also link to a file which is stored in a Dropbox or cloud storage, for instance. So we can give it a year, um, a note. And we have to specify an, a URL which can link to a file somewhere um, which will via HTTPS. For instance, mybox.com and uh, specified by a UUID. And if we've done this, we need to reload it. And we can see that um, this is listed here as a non counter report, which can be reached um, by this link. Yeah, this is all I wanted to show you today. If there are any questions, um, please feel free to ask in the chat. Interesting. And um, uh, Thunderjet has a, a slightly different way of, of doing the uploads and the linking to external files um, in the invoices app. But it's, it's good to see the, the two different stylings that, that might be possible. OK. I didn't know about it in the invoices app, so I have to. No worries. <laughs> All right, so next is my crew in Folijet. Um, so we have been working all uh, for all of the Iris sprints on um, an overhaul of the, the engine that does most of the data import processing, um, moving it from PubSub, which is not deprecated, but it's, it's being used in different ways, over to some Kafka Direct. We wanted to show that today, but um, it's shaky in our local environment and with kind of the, the uh, shakiness of the shared environments, we decided to wait until next time. Um, so in the meantime, Velodia is going to show um, how we have replaced the secret button or the magic button that was uh, a default import profile for instances. And then Maria is going to show the beginnings of a log um, the, the urgency for the log is becoming bigger and bigger. We don't have the capacity to do the full complicated log this uh, in Iris, but we, we wanted to make a try at something that's more, um, de uh, more detailed than what they're seeing right now. So, Velodia? Yes, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So, uh, 
Hello everyone. Uh, so our team removed secret button functionality. Uh, it was needed for applying default mapping rules for the data import. Uh, when we removed this button, we added new default uh, job profile. Uh, with this default uh, mapping rules. So uh, you can see this uh, job profile with specific uh, tree with section profile, mapping profile, description and others. And uh, now I want to demonstrate you how to use it. So uh, we uh, select data import, choose uh, random mark file, uh, select uh, default uh, job profile, which I already show for you, and run it. So you can see that, yeah, uh, status is completed with this job profile. So now let's retrieve work. And uh, this is uh, instance HRID, let's find this one. Yeah, so this uh, this is newly created instance with specific data uh, for each field, uh, which was applied by uh, like uh, default mapping rules. And uh, you can use this job profile. Uh, moreover, I want to add that you can edit and uh, modify this job profile. So feel free to use it. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thanks, Volodia. And Maria? Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate our new job summary screen. And currently I'm on the data import landing page. And uh, I imported a file. So let's click on the file name. And we get to the job summary screen. Um, so here we can see which records were created or updated. And if the were some errors, for example, which uh, will be shown on this error column, but we will see here just like error label and to see errors, more details, um, we will need to navigate to another page. It's uh, under development now. Uh, so we can see that for all uh, records, uh, SRS Smart Beep and instance were created. In addition to the created status, there also can be updated status if uh, some record type was updated, multiple status if uh, record type was both created and updated, or discarded status if, for example, a job was stopped due to some error. Also, at the bottom of the table, we have a lot more button for files which contain more than 100 records. Here we have 262 records. And by clicking on this button, and we will get 100 more records. And I think that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks, Masha. It's looking good. All right. Okay, next is Concord. So, Magda? Hello, everyone. Uh, on Concord, uh, we uh, finished implementing the quick export functionality. We completed the last missing part, which was showing the um, the selected records. Um, on uh, uh, mapping profile, we work on improved uh, data entry validation. 
uh, and this will this functionality will be demoed by uh, Elizabeth shortly. We also improved the error, error log uh, implementation. However, we ran into the problems before um, the demo to populate it, it with the um, variety of errors that we are supporting right now. So most likely you will see just the generic uh, errors uh, when the um, record when the records are not fine the uid provided are not valid or if the record did not start uh, export did not start because of some environmental issues um in addition to the front end work we also uh, in, um, added uh, some uh, rules mapping default mapping rules for identifiers uh, for invalid ISSN, linked ISSN, and uh, invalid ISBN. This work will be uh, demonstrated by Igor. Um, in addition, Concord uh, continued to work on stabilizing our APMH and uh, started working on the uh, SRS or MAC search. But for those two, we will uh, be probably providing demo in the following uh, demos. That's it from me. Uh, Elisaveta, are you ready? Yep, let me share the screen. Great. Uh, so hopefully you can see it now. Uh, so let me start with the inventory app. And we added the possibility to quick export the records. So yeah, as you can see, every record uh, now has a checkbox, so you can be able to check the needed records and the, uh, also the amount of selected records is displayed right there. Uh, you can see all the selected records in, under the action menu and this show selected records model, which uh, displays every picked uh, record and you can also uncheck some of the records if you just decide like maybe you that maybe you don't need this and it will also uncheck the records here on the inventory search results so <clears throat> triggering uh, uh, triggering quick export uh, drop you to to do this you, you need to click this export instances options and it will uh, run the job and uh, will save this uh, quick export CSV file, which contains a list of the UIDs and um, on the data export app, you can see that uh, it exported the records using uh, this quick export job, which uh, runs using the uh, default mapping profiles rules. Um, so moving on to the uh, updates to the transformation fields we have for the mapping profiles. Uh, we updated a little bit uh, a form, so now it contains the placeholder text for users to be able to see what kind of data it expects. And we also updated the way it uh, validates uh, the fields. So for, for instance, if users enters invalid data, in the inputs, uh, <clears throat> it will uh, highlight all the invalid uh, inputs and will change them. Uh, it will um, hide the invalid uh, border uh, for every uh, one. And while addressing the last field in the mm, the last invalid field in the transformation group like so it will also hide the overall um, in, um, validation error so you can save it just like this and also yeah as magda mentioned we updated the um, error logs for the failed and failed with errors um, jobs um, it now uh, contains a little bit more descript description, descriptive messages, uh, which um, also are being translated. So that's it from me. Um, and Igor will pick it up from there. Thank you.
Thank you, Elisabetta. Igor, are you ready? Uh, hello, I'm sharing. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Do you see something? Not yet. Not yet. And it doesn't look like it's trying. So, oh, here it comes. Now we got it. What about right now? Yes. Uh, do you see data expert? Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, I want to show some pretty interesting uh, kind of mapping that we use in data experts to generate mark uh, records from 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 the incoming inventory instances. And the feature is about generating mark records. And uh, the mapping the mapping is about appending mark subfields to the existing subfields in mark record. And uh, I, I, I just want to explain this mapping uh, on the semantic web primary instance. This is, uh, this is my favorite one instance and I always demo it. So uh, let's take a look on it. I edit, uh, so the mapping itself is about identifiers and uh, the mapping is written in default mapping rules. And uh, we have a couple of mapping rules and so all the rules uh, are about identifiers. So if the record already contains uh, ISBN identifier in the field, uh, in the field uh, uh, 020 uh, subfield A, then uh, subfield Z should be appended uh, with the invalid uh, ISBN with the invalid version of ISBN. Uh, the same it works for ISSN. So if the record contains uh, ISSN identifier in uh, uh, 0 0.22 subfield, then subfield uh, Z should be appended with the invalid version of ISSN. And uh, what about linking ISSN? Uh, uh, it will be appended uh, in case if the record contains ISSN or invalid ISSN. Uh, and uh, if, if the record already contains uh, GPO item number, this is uh, 074 uh, field, subfield A, then, then uh, subfield Z should be appended with the canceled version of uh, GPO item number. This is why I added all the identifiers uh, in this uh, instance. And let's just export it and see how it works and what's the mark record. So I just uh, take semantic web primer and start uh, data export <clears throat> using default mapping prof default uh, job profile with default mapping profile. So here is it. Uh, let's download the file and open it with uh, Mark Editor. Semantic Web Primer number five, and here is it. The result of mapping. So we have uh, we have uh, all the fields in place. We have uh, two hundred. Uh, we have zero twenty with the uh, ISBN and it's invalid version, invalid ISBN. We have 0.22 with uh, the ISSN, linking ISSN and it's invalid version. And we have 0.74 field with uh, GPO item number uh, and it's canceled version, canceled GPO uh, item number in the Z subfield. So it works like this. Uh, this is all about me. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. All right, looks good. And Igor, you can't escape without hello, hello from your old team. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, next up is core functional, Matt. Hello, greetings. Um, I'm going to uh, run through just a couple of 
uh, enhancements here pretty quickly because my internet is unstable at the moment. I don't wanna drop out on you. Um, so let me share this. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm gonna start out here in lost item fee policies. And if you look in the lost item fee section, um, you'll see that we've expanded it. Uh, so in addition to the standard um, items here for age to lost regular items, we also have a new section, a couple of controls for uh, age to lost recalled items. And they work basically the same way as the, the standard ones here. Uh, we can um, set an interval and, uh, and um, we've also uh, added that into the uh, interoperate, oper what am I trying to say? The um, validation uh, between different uh, items here in the form. So this has been added into the set cost validation and, and so forth. Um, and they work pretty much as you'd expect. Um, when you create a new fee policy, they'll kick into action. Um, and then I'm just going to skip over now to staff slips. Uh, so previously we had added uh, patron comments to requests in a couple of places, and now we've expanded that to a couple of more places. Um, so if we uh, look at one of our staff slips here, um, and go into edit, we now have patron comments available as a token. And so I can um, oops, I should create a new line for that. Um, I can edit that in as a token to my uh, template here for the pick slip, staff slip. And that will now um, come into play if there is a patron comment. This is the uh, sample about um, in requests that will appear uh, when you when you go to uh, print pick slips uh, if they're available. Uh, this actually there's a slight glitch in requests at the moment that is preventing this from from uh, appearing, but it will be there soon. And so finally, the third place we've added uh, these uh, comments to is this hold shelf clearance report. And I've already set this up in advance, so we have a a request here with a patron comment, and uh, that has already expired on the hold shelf, so it's available on the report. And I've um, pre-downloaded a report for expediency, and so now if we come over to the end here, we've got our patron comments in the report as well. And I think that's it for my end. Uh, sorry for rushing through that, but uh, I think I can pass it over to Sergey now. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Marie. Uh, let me share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes. Okay. First of all, I want to bring your attention to the new item statuses that have appeared in the inventory search and filter pane here. And uh, these are uh, in process non-requestable, uh, intellectual item, loan missing, uh, restricted, unavailable, and unknown item statuses. Uh, at that moment, uh, we have implemented only uh, only the intellectual item and restricted statuses, which I'm going to demo to you. And uh, um, let's take, oh, sorry, I have to say that I'm going to show uh, one, uh, only one of my stories from the demo uh, in my local environment. There's a, there was a glitch and we are working on it. And uh, here on my local environment, you can see, let's take the uh, item with status available, for example, this. And uh, on the item details page, you can see that there are two new items in the actions menu. 
and they work the same way after clicking on the menu item the confirmation model appears with the corresponding status in the model header and in the model message after confirmation uh, the status of the items changes to the selected one yeah mm. now we can move to the follow testing environment and uh, let's try to check check in the item with status restricted restricted yeah and let's check it copy barcode check in uh, and uh, before that let's note that no we can check the checkbox suppressed from discovery uh, in the item record page save let's go to check in and after scanning the item the confirmation model message says that the item has status restricted and is suppressed from discovery um, if the checkbox is not selected the phrase suppressed from discovery will not appear it's obvious after clicking confirm button the status of the item will change to the in transit to service point uh, to effective location uh, let's check it item details and uh, yeah item status in transit to circulation this desk one uh, and finally uh, let's look at the behavior of the item with status intellectual item when we try to check check it in and check it out uh, after oh copy let's go to check in after scanning this item in check-in application uh, you can see that the message says that this item has status intellectual item and cannot be checked in when we try to check out this item after scanning uh, a similar message says the same thing we can this item cannot be checked out in other words so when the item has status intellectual item the <clears throat> the system prevents it from being checked in and checked out and that's it from me thank you for your attention if you have any questions please ask thank you sergey and um uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one that um, has a question about what the intellectual item status means. Um, Charlotte, is there like a short definition or an example of when it might be used that you could give? If Charlotte, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a temporary temporary title for this. Mm -hmm. The uh, example giving uh, Chicago will use the uh, intellectual um, item status for uh, dummy records for uh, bandwidth. That's one use case. Okay. Good to know. Um, and so I'll also mention that um, data import has some corresponding work to do um, to allow for the new statuses, but I'm waiting to open those stories until uh, the rest of the, the new statuses are in place, which I think will be in the next couple of sprints. Yeah. All we, have right. in, we have pulled in all uh, the remaining um, stories into the sprint, which began today. Um, but so fingers crossed that it will be um, by this sprint or the next, then we are done. Excellent. Terrific. Thank you, Charlotte. 
All right, and last but not least, we have the Falcons. Wolfgang? Yeah, hello guys. Let me share my screen. Yeah, hope you can see it. So today I'm going to show you where we are with the mod search implementation. Um, this actually is a new um, uh, microservice, a new model that uh, will um, allow us to search for uh, inventory resources uh, using some advanced um, full text search capabilities for uh, using Elasticsearch engine. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to um, briefly describe some high level uh, design and uh, actually uh, this uh, small flow chart describes uh, how we um, replicate uh, data between uh, PostgreSQL database and Elasticsearch engine. So here you can see that we have mod inventory storage that uses Postgres and persists everything to the Postgres. And uh, when the user um, executes a create, update, or delete uh, API endpoint, we first of all um, do everything with the, with the database. And uh, after that, we, in case uh, the action was successful, we are publishing a domain event Actually, the main event um, uh, contains um, old or old in use state of the instance or inventory resource. Um, contains also tenant ID and the type of the action. So whether it was uh, create or update or delete. Yeah, so actually um, uh, this event is published directly to a Kafka topic each um, we have a separate topic per each uh, um, record type so separate for instance separate for for item and for holding record records yeah and after publishing we are just uh, um, returning uh, a response to the to the mod inventory storage client and uh, then mod search uh, consume uh, these domain events from the Kafka topic and uh, apply everything needed to the Elasticsearch um, engine. And uh, a mod search user can uh, run some queries against uh, uh, mod search. And in this case, Elasticsearch will be used. Yeah, okay, let's, let's try it. Um, today I'm going to show end-to-end -end, uh, flow for instances. Um, I'm going to create an instance, then uh, we will take a look at Kafka and see uh, that message is published to, to a Kafka, uh, Kafka topic, then uh, we will use Postman and we'll uh, run a query to mod search in order to find this a uh, newly created instance, and then we will do the the same thing when uh, we update this instance. Yeah, but uh, first, let me let me start a Kafka consumer. Yeah, so we will uh, see uh, all the messages that will be published to this uh, inventory instance topic. Okay, now let's create an instance. Let's give it name. And uh, we also, let's set required properties and probably just set language. Yeah, okay, so um, instance is created. Let's take a look at Kafka console. Yeah, so here you can see that at the very beginning we have some useful uh, Okapi headers that propagated from the region uh, mod inventory uh, storage request. So we have Okapi URL and uh, Okapi tenant ID. 
and uh, here we have message payload it has um, type of the action it was create tenant id and the uh, new state of the um, of the record so actually this uh, state of the record that was created okay and uh, now uh, I'm, I'm using postman and I uh, will uh, call the search uh, the search microservice to to get instances with the demo instance that contains demo instance word. Yeah, so here it is. Here we have our demo instance indexed. Okay, let's now try to update the instance. And I'm going to add um, this updated word. Okay, it is saved. Yeah, and now we can see that another message is received. It is about um, instance update. And here we have all the representation, previous representation of the instance. And um, we also have, yeah, here we have the new representation of the instance. And um, yeah, let's now try to uh, update our query and uh, see if the record was updated. Yeah, here it is. It has the proper um, title. Um, yeah, let's probably try to um, run query by ID in order to make sure that there is only one um, instance. Yeah, so only one instance. Um, let me also quickly show you um, a wildcard card search so we can use HR ID field in order to run a wildcard search. So for example, I'm looking for instances that have IN and zero prefix. So it is most of the records. Yeah, so it's pretty fast. Uh, half of the second and um, it uh, was to mention that uh, we have a lot of um, instances in, in the Elasticsearch um, uh, index. Uh, it is now about um, 100,000. So for example, if we run some query, Yeah, so here you can see that there are a lot of instances. Yeah, that's actually it about uh, what I can show. Any questions? I have a quick question, Bodan. Um, uh, that uh, result count you showed, that's the exactly uh, count number? Yeah, the exact, the exact okay. amount of records. Yay. Awesome, Yay. awesome. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Bohdan. Um, and much search work is being done. This inventory search and the, the work that Cornell um, is POing for the SRS querying. So it's great to see it getting better and getting to accurate counts, Charlotte. All right, very quickly, because we're out of time, I am going to just share um, the PowerPoint again quickly. All right, so the next two sprints are normal two week sprints now that we're out of the holidays. Um, the sprint calendar has been updated to reflect the changes to the IRIS um, uh, milestone dates. So please check that if you have any questions. Um, and then in addition in the uh, PowerPoint that will be attached to the recording. Um, you'll see the upcoming work for the various teams. Um, I wanted to mention that Spitfire is um, starting to pick up quick mark work. Um, I think we talked about it briefly at the beginning. 
Um, so they're going to be taking over um, some work to begin to ex expand Quick Mark from the uh, Firebird team. And I think that's it for today. So thanks everybody for sticking with us a few extra minutes and um, the recording will be up soon. All right, everybody have a great afternoon, evening, whatever time it is for you. Thank you. Thank you, have a good day, bye. Bye-bye.